Great. Well, thank you so much for getting active in the chat. We want this to be a discussion. Um, as we go through the meetup and you're thinking of questions, uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, that we are just using uh, to post your questions. We wanna have a nice discussion, nice dialogue. It's a little bit strange. Usually we do these meetups in person, uh, but we're delighted that we're able to still come together as a community and uh, you know, learn about time series and support one another during these really unusual times. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Welcome to the first ever all virtual time series meetup. We're glad that you're joining us. As a reminder, if you have anything to ask as we go along, there's a Q&A option, which you'll see on your screen in the Zoom menu. Um, it is after all uh, a community call, so it's an opportunity to share and learn, and we wanna encourage all of your questions, comments, and conversation along the way. Um, as I quickly mentioned earlier, I'm Michael Ellis, uh, the new community manager here at Influx. Uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of me in the future. Uh, previously, I worked at Mozilla on various projects and community programs. Um, I've been at Influx Data a little over a month now, and I'm super excited to be on board and working to support the Influx DB community. Uh, additionally with us on the call today is our awesome group of panelists and presenters. Uh, today we're joined by speakers Anais Dotis Georgiou from Influx Data, as well as Al Alex Tavjan from Playtech. Also with us today are panelists Chris Chirillo, Sebastian Borza, and Caitlin Croft from Influx Data. Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, today we'll have two presentations. Anais will be speaking about profit for forecasts with InfluxDB, and Alex will share about how to better grow peppers using time series technology. Um, after each of the talks, we will pause for some Q&A with the speakers. Feel free to post your questions, as I said earlier, as we go along, and we'll answer during the Q&A portion. After our talks, we'll share some announcements and job opportunities with the groups. And if you or your company currently has any open positions to fill, we encourage you to share with the group during this portion of the call. Uh, finally, we'll conclude with a swag raffle. We have some cool goodies to give out like socks, t-shirts, and hoodies. And so we'll do that at the end of the call. Uh, you must be present on the call to win, so stay tuned. And uh, just as a quick point, thank you all for registering uh, to join the Zoom webinar. It's something that Zoom requires for these. I just wanna remind everyone that's here today that your information is not gonna be used for marketing purposes. Uh, we did use this list for the purposes of uh, randomly selecting some swag raffle winners, and we'll reach out to the raffle winners via email to gather their shipping information, uh, but we'll not be retaining this data afterwards or for any other purpose. So our first presenter today is Anais. She's a developer advocate here at Influx Data. Uh, she's a smart, talented, all-around awesome person to work with. Uh, like me, she's based in Austin, Texas. She is no stranger to meetups. Uh, she's spoken at many around the uh, globe. Uh, today, she'll be speaking about profit for forecasts with InfluxDB, and we'll have some time for Q&A after her talk. Uh, Anais, are you ready to begin sharing your screen? Sure thing, one second. No worries. Let oh, me I can't ready. share. Yeah, as soon as you stop sharing, I'll share, right. okay. Oops. Whoa. All right, can everyone see my screen? We can see it. Okay, sweet. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this virtual meetup. This is actually pretty exciting because I do host a, or have hosted a meetup here in Austin before, but it can be kind of challenging to get people to have time to come out and uh, bear through traffic to come and uh, actually attend the meetup. So this is really cool because I see that there's a lot of people that have joined and um, yeah, that's just really exciting. So today I'm going to talk to you about time series databases and forecasting using Facebook profit. Um, I'm going to actually change my talk a little bit right now as I'm talking about it and not talk in detail about that much in detail about why it is that you need 
uh, time series database because I am now just realizing that if you're attending this time series uh, meetup, virtual meetup, you might be a little bit more familiar with time series databases than I had originally anticipated. Um, so with that in mind, let me take a second to just introduce myself. I really appreciate Michael for um, you introducing me earlier, but I thought I'd share some more little details about me. So I am a developer at advocate at Influx Data, and I've been here for about two years. Um, Influx Data is a great place to work, and the people are really awesome. So um, I recommend you stick around to hear more about uh, the open positions that we have. I am on an East Jackie Dotus on LinkedIn, and um, my Twitter is on East Dotus, so I encourage you to connect with me there as well. Um, some things that you might not know about me is that I really enjoy making digital art. And I also have two really cute cats named Chester and Nikita. And I love this picture. I hope it brightens your day a little bit like it does mine. So next I'm just going to define what a time series is. So a time series is just a uh, series of data points that's indexed in time order. Pretty self-explanatory. And we see time series data um, pretty much everywhere. So we see it in IoT monitoring. I have trouble thinking of um, an IoT device that isn't a sensor and all sensors are gathering time series data. And there are now like what, 200 billion um, devices in the wild. So a lot of time series data coming from that. Um, software teams all over the world are also expected to move faster and test earlier and release more frequently and do all this while improving quality and reducing costs. So that means that you need to also um, employ DevOps monitoring. And so you need to gather you know, metrics like um, system metrics, you need to maybe track third party or other integration points, you might need to monitor Kubernetes or Jenkins or Docker, do CI CD monitoring, do things like um, monitor deployment frequency, change fixes or change volume bugs, bug fixes. There's, just a bunch of stuff in DevOps monitoring, right? So that's a huge source of time series data. We also see time series data appearing in business analytics. Um, FinTech is a really classic example um, and basically everywhere. So time series is pretty huge. And that is why you need a purpose-built time series database to handle that time series data because most likely you're going to be dealing with really high ingest and also, um, with InfluxDB, one thing that makes uh, InfluxDB pretty unique is that you can handle um, writing data at the nanosecond precision. Um, so this is Influx data stack we have uh, for V2. Um, if you guys are familiar with InfluxDB V1, um, capacitor and chronograph, um, which were other components of the stack, were separated out. And then in V2, we are putting them all together and we're still keeping Telegraph separate. So if you aren't that familiar with um, InfluxDB um, or Telegraph, I uh, highly recommend you checking out both because they're all open source. Um, and Telegraph especially is really cool. If you're um, looking to adopt a time series database and you're not sure that you wanna use InfluxDB, you can always start with Telegraph, which Telegraph is a collection agent and it allows you to scrape and report metrics and it's plugin driven. There are over 200 plugins. One thing that makes Telegraph really cool is that over 90% of them were contributed to by the community. So if you ever need help with Telegraph, there is a vast wealth of knowledge and support out there for you. Um, and uh, you can write to any database of your choosing, whether that's Cassandra, um, Elastic, Prometheus, it doesn't matter. So yeah, um, give both a try. Uh, another like small bit of me advocating for Telegraph is one cool feature about it is that you can um, store metrics in memory. So if you need to do any sort of update to your core infrastructure, you won't lose metrics. So it's just like all around a good thing to use um, if you're looking to uh, increase resiliency. Um, another kind of d benchmark that I like to share with people about why Influx is awesome is just this single node ingest benchmark because it really illustrates that time series is different and that you're ingesting a huge amount of data. And so for example, if you're using an R4 for Excel instance and you have a series cardinality of 10,000, this is um, all the way on the right, 
then your ingest rate can be up to 800,000 points per second. Um, so yeah, you just need to be able to use a database that can handle that sort of ingest, and that's a time series database like InfluxDB specifically. So now that we've covered um, why it is that you would use a time series database, uh, we're gonna go from macro to micro here in this presentation, and then go through now how it is that we can leverage uh, Facebook's Profit, um, which is a time series forecasting library to create univariate time series forecasts. So before we begin, I just wanted to um, talk about why it was created and what it aims to achieve. So first, completely um, and successfully uh, tuning automated forecasting techniques or non-automated forecasting techniques can be extremely difficult. And it, they're often the case that they're too inflexible to incorporate useful assumptions too. And then secondly, uh, the analysts that are typically responsible for various data science tasks throughout an organization um, most likely will have extreme deep domain expertise about specific products, products, uh, services, data sets, et cetera. That's their job, right? Um, but they might not have training in time series forecasting. Time series data from a math perspective, from a statistical perspective, is extremely unique. It is hard to identify the success of um, forecasting algorithms successfully. It is, it is just a wily beast, and it's very unique in, in the data world. Um, so it's, it's not rare that a data scientist might not have that particular type of knowledge. And so Facebook looked at these problems, and it said, like, let's try and create this library and address those um, by making profit very easy to use so that a large number of people could make forecasts and possibly without specific time, time series training. And then secondly, um, they also tried to make forecasts adaptable to a large variety of forecasting problems um, and specifically with potentially idiosyncratic features. And what I mean by that is that a lot of other forecasting techniques, like you might think of ARIMA um, um, or Holt Winters, require that you have uh, regular time series data. And Profit doesn't. So if your data set is irregular, you can still use Profit. And that's a huge advantage because the real world is messy and um, your data might not be regular. And maybe you don't want to go through the extra step of aggregating it to force it to be regular. So now I'm going to briefly describe to you how it is that um, Profit works. And so basically, it uses time as a regressor. And Profit tries to fit several linear and nonlinear functions of time um, as components um, for the forecast. And it models seasonality as an additive component, similar to the approach that's taken by Holt winters or exponential smoothing, if you're familiar with those techniques. Um, so in its essence, Profit uh, frames the forecasting problem as a curve fitting exercise. And so we have y of t, which is our forecast, and that is equal to um, g of t, which is this piecewise linear logistic growth curve, which um, is modeled by sampling the data at regular change points. And then we have an addition of the seasonality or the periodic changes, which is represented by S of T. And then we also include, are able to include any effects of holidays or irregular schedules. And these are um, parameters that are included by the user. Um, and then finally, it also accounts for any error um, or unusual changes that are not accom accommodated by the model. So um, yeah, that's essentially how it works um, in a broad, broad kind of overview. Um, I will say the addition of being able to add effects of holidays and irregular schedules is really cool um, because uh, it just allows you so much flexibility. And also it has predefined um, holidays from all different countries um, as a part of the, the library. So you can just like really easily drop in all the US holidays um, if you need to include that in your analysis. So now I will be talking to you about how it is that we can set up Telegraph because I'm going to read some um, time series data from a CSV 
and then I will show you how to use the Python client and then we're going to convert the data frame into or convert the data into a data frame so the output from the client into a data frame and then finally we're going to make a forecast with profit and all this is really easy but I'm just going to make the simplest um, forecast I can and I got this example in the data set from the quick start example on github for profit so if um, you're looking for that data you can find it there as well um, if you find me on github um, there's a repo there too and I'll go over those resources at the end of this presentation so before we begin um, if you're not familiar uh, with Telegraph. Um, basically, it's just a Toml configuration and we will specify the inputs and outputs and the input will be a CSV file that we're reading from and the output will be in FluxDB. But in order for me to use the config, I need to gather a couple of metrics. And before I do that, I can just generate a config um, with the uh, input plugins of my choice um, and store that under a config of the name that I choose with the first command um, that's listed here, which is just telegraph um, dash dash input filter file is my input filter. Um, the output is influxdb, and um, I'm going to store that config in a config called profit data. And so I need to find. Hello, was that supposed to happen? I'll just continue. Okay. Um, Cool. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so I just need to get some parameters first in order to run Telegraph successfully. And that includes things like my um, org and the bucket that I want to write my data into. So one way you can find uh, the org is by that command. Um, you can also find it through the UI. So finally, when I want to run my config, all I do is call Telegraph and I pass the config that I want to run, which is profitdata.com. So like I said, you can also find your org and your bucket and all your, all your auth parameters um, in the UI. Um, my org is listed at the top left where it says org dash settings. My org is actually called org. Um, I can find my tokens um, in the settings um, tab at the bottom there. If I were to click on tokens, I could find all my tokens. So pretty easy to do. Um, and now I can include all that information in my config under the output section. So I will include the port that Influx is running on, I will include my token, and I will include my organization and the bucket that I want to write my data into. So this is what my data looks like. It's just the number of views um, of a football player, I think, or like, Wikipedia views of some football player and I wish I remembered his name, but I don't really know anything about football. So my apologies um, But yeah, so that's what our data set is and um, One important thing to note is that when we end up making a forecast with profit and we convert this into a data frame You want to make sure that have one data frame column named DS that's will represent your date and why will always represent the historical data that you want to make a forecast on. So we're taking that CSV and we're using the file plugin to um, upload the CSV and parse it and basically write that data to Influx. And so now we can visualize our data really simply. Um, and that is done by just going to the data explorer, clicking on the bucket that our data is in looking at the measurement, which is views. Um, and I just specified that in the file portion of uh, the input portion of my config. Um, you can see that I have, well, I, ha I guess I added a measurement column called views. Maybe I did that up above. Yeah, there you go. Um, and, yeah, and so I just select my field, which is Y, which is the number of views. So now I'm ready to use the client to query my data. So I just have to uh, connect to the client and using my, um, specifying my port and also my token. And then I can create a flux query, which just is also created for you when you click through the query builder. Um, so if we're up here in the UI and we see that we have 
we're in the query builder mode now, which is just the click, click through mode. And then if you see next to the blue submit button on the bottom right, on the left of that is script editor. So we could see that exact query there if we um, are new to Flux. So that's a great tool for learning Flux. And so we submit that, we use that query to query our instance and um, gen get the results back. I just wanted to show you what the raw results look like just in case um, you're doing something else with them and you're not um, going to be using uh, data frames. And this is how I converted those raw results into a data frame. But if you are going to use data frames in your analysis, I recommend just using the query data frame method at, that is part of the client. And so that's pretty simple. All you do is um, take the client um, and attach the method and specify the query that you want. And then the output, instead of having the raw output, is data frame. So now we're finally ready to actually use profit. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is first we're going to fit the model by instantiating a new profit object and any settings including holidays, changing seasonality, etc., um, change point settings, those are all going to be passed into that constructor. And then you call its fit method and pass in the historical data frame. And fitting is pretty fast, it should only take a couple seconds. Um, and so now we need to get ready to make a prediction. And we're gonna do that on a data frame with a uh, DS column that will contain the dates that we want to make the prediction onto. So if we see, if we use this make future data frame method, we including the number of days that I wanna make a forecast onto. And if we look at the tail of that data frame, we can see that there are no Y values because it's blank because we haven't made our forecast yet. Um, so now we're actually ready to make our forecast and it's, uh, with one line, you can just say that you can just use a predict method um, and that assigns each row in that future predicted um, value data frame and it names it y hat. And so um, if you pass in historical dates, it will also provide you an in-sample fit and you get your confidence intervals um, where you have y hat upper and y hat lower, which represents the upper and lower confidence intervals respectively. And so if we look at the tail of the forecast, we can see that um, those same dates that previously were empty and didn't have any of those columns now have been populated with our forecast. And I then wrote this data back to InfluxDB. Um, for this example, because it was just on how to use profit, I did something really silly, which was to convert the data frame into an array of strings that are inline protocol, which is InfluxDB's ingest format. And then I use the client to directly write that. I don't recommend doing it that way. I think a much smarter way would be to actually write this data to a CSV and then um, use Telegraph. And that way um, you could use, for example, the tail plugin um, and just keep writing whatever additional points you're, write, you're writing or you're creating forecasts. So you could even um, create forecasts periodically, let's say. And again, I can visualize um, my forecast really easily here. So, Pink is my original raw data. Uh, the blue line and the orange line are my uh, upper and lower confidence intervals respectively. And um, the purple line is my forecast. Um, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, other things that Profit can do. I recommend checking out the full list of parameters. i uh, sure they have documentation somewhere. I just found it in the source there. Um, but like I said, you can add holidays. If you can also add scheduling. So if you're gathering data around the clock, but you know that data from a particular time window, let's say like nine to 12, is particularly important, um, you can specify that and then also adjust the, the um, amount of stress that you wanna put on like that schedule. Um, you can also create saturation thresholds. So if you know that your system is bounded by physical limitations and that, for example, your trend cannot exceed um, a certain threshold, then you can include those lower and upper thresholds. You can also adjust the change point prior scale. So if you know that your trend is wildly changing uh, very frequently, then you can decrease that scale so that, in, so that profit samples the data more frequently so that it can create a more accurate um, forecast. Similarly, 
if your trend is very consistent, then you could um, increase the change point prior scare, scale, sample the data less often for that logistic linear um, curve fitting part of the model. Um, and then finally, another cool feature of uh, profit is that you can add other regressors. So if you happen to know future values um, for other time series components or data that's related to your time series, you can include those other series as regressors for your univariate time, for your forecast. Uh, finally, I just want to address the question that a lot of people have whenever I suggest using a client, which is why? Um, why should I perform um, my machine learning um, client side and why, why can't I carry it out server side? And the first answer I have for that is that the Python client is extremely performant. So um, if you look at this test that was performed, there's a single thread um, under the benchmark conditions that are listed below. We were able to write um, 4.6 million points in 21 seconds. I also uh, performed a similar exper experiment on my local machine and um, on my machine and was able to write um, like a million points in 21 seconds, but that was with other applications running and like limited RAM. Um, so yeah, it's really powerful. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is that it just makes sense to pull data out of InfluxDB. I think it, InfluxDB should be thought of as a time series data lake um, and that you need to use a TSDB like InfluxDB because many platforms just can't handle the data ingest rate that you need for all your time series data. But once you have your data in Influx and you open up the UI and you do some preliminary data exploration or data analysis, then you notice that certain series need to be handled with more care or they need further, further analysis and it makes sense to then move that data set to a data warehouse because you get to isolate that workload and all the algorithms and resources that you need um, to apply to it. Um, in one place, so you get to isolate that. And then finally, um, you know, in v.1, uh, we did have capacitor, which allowed you to create UDFs and do this sort of, sort of apply whatever analysis you want server side. But it turns out that learning like a custom um, language uh, to, to take advantage of a processing engine um, is a lot more work. And it turns out that a lot of data scientists I talk to actually prefer to just use the tools that they're already familiar with. Um, so I think just pulling the data out makes sense for that reason too. Um, whoops, I didn't quite mean to do that yet, although that is pretty much the end of my presentation. Here are some lists of resources and I uh, will try and share them with you in the chat. In the chat. I also highly recommend um, checking out our community uh, Slack channel and community page at community.influxdata.com because if you have any questions at all, my part of my job is to just um, be on the sites and answer any questions that you have. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Just a moment while I pull my screen back up for sharing. Anise, are you uh, able to handle a couple of questions from the audience real quick? Sure thing. Uh, Raymond asks, what percentage confidence interval uh, that requirement varies within the industries? Yeah, you can adjust that. So I think the one that I had was 90, but it, it's up to you. It's just a parameter you set. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is one that a few people had asked. Uh, will we have access to this recording after the presentation? Uh, yes, we will be recording this call and we will be uploading it uh, to our YouTube channel so people can watch later on if they were unable to join live. Uh, Victor had a comment uh, in terms of other uses. Uh, he said probably residuals can also be studied. Would you say that's right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ashish Kumar asks, is profit widely used at enterprise level or the ARIMA and AR models also? So um, I've spoken to people that have, def have used it at enterprise level. Um, and I've had some data scientists explain to me that 
part of the reason that they like to use profit as opposed to ARIMA is because um, like uh, auto ARIMA, for example, it can actually output a, a pretty good prediction, but sometimes because the tuning is happening automatically, it, the tuning might not be extremely precise. And so sometimes the output of the forecast is just a straight line or like a seemingly straight line. And it, this is what people have described to me because I haven't ever had to like actually create profits, uh, forecasts and um, explain or validate them to um, uh, other members that aren't necessarily data scientists before. But I've, I've heard people say that because the forecast is, even though it might perform well with ARIMA, because it's like a flat line, um, it ends up appearing as um, and not as impressive, which isn't a good reason to not use ARIMA, but um, it makes it harder to explain um, to people that aren't necessarily data scientists. And so for certain people I've talked to since, the um, there wasn't like a huge advantage in terms of accuracy with using ARIMA. Um, having the Facebook profit emit a curve that changes and is, appears to be more dynamic um, also looked more successful. And so it was easier to get buy-in from members of, their, of other teams, for example. Um, but there's no reason to not use ARIMA like from a, um, a math perspective. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I think we have time just so we can stay on schedule for one more question. Uh, for anyone else, uh, Victor particularly, um, I suggest that we reach out uh, via the forums to follow up with additional questions related to how residuals could be studied, uh, things of that nature. And uh, for a final question, can you visualize only real-time forecasts or can we visualize the forecast in the future, say for the next hour? Uh, for sure, um, I think I, understand your question. Um, I think that's what we were doing. So maybe I don't understand your question. Because um, that forecast is for the next year. So I was also visualizing the hour. Are you asking if we can perform? I don't Yeah, maybe you can get back to me or like ask me that question again in community because I'm having trouble understanding. But I think we did that today. So yes. <laughs> So absolutely, it is possible to forecast into the future, uh, whether it's a year or an hour, uh, that's absolutely doable. And you can reach out uh, if you have any follow-up questions or you'd like more information about how to achieve that. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I'm just checking over uh, the new comments in the chat. Oh, wow, we had quite a few ones. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone. If we have any uh, leftover time at the end of the call, we'll circle back to these unanswered questions. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Alexander Tobgen to the group. Uh, Alex is a software architect at Playtech and is a bit of a digital nomad. Additionally, he's one of the most recent uh, people to be awarded the distinction of being an Influx Ace. If you're not familiar, Influx Ace is our community-owned uh, program. Uh, it's filled with Rockstar community members who are committed to sharing their expertise on all things related to time series. Uh, Alex, congratulations again on becoming an Influx Ace, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, are you ready and able to share your screen? Yes, thank you very much, and yeah. I'm ready to share my screen. All right, I've stopped sharing and ready whenever you are. Yeah, I'm ready. We can see it. Yeah, so we can start. So, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Alexander Tavgen and uh, I am more than 20 years of in, in that industry, uh, starting in the beginning of uh, like millennium. And uh, I have a lot of different kind of hobbies, uh, making a cultural project more friendly with technology, where it helps to express some artistic means. Uh, I, have a, some, I have some lectures uh, in universities related with Python with the algorithms and data structure, a lot of different kind of publications related with time series. And um, it was quite interesting for, for me to uh, 
got the previous talk information because the uh, the main idea how can we uh, forecast some data is quite uh, is quite important for a different kind of uh, in different areas let's say in operations we can say that we have some probably problems in the business intelligence uh, we can uh, we can compare our results or something uh, or in term of capacity planning etc etc so that's why we write also open source team processing engine time tricks where we oriented to work uh, to work on a scale uh, with a huge amount of uh, metrics so I mean that uh, a lot of a lot of uh, frameworks where you can create some sort of models for different kind of predictions uh, you have a limitation uh, for how many data you can process at the time and uh, in case of large enterprises in case of amount of data or for example the case study which i start to present is related to internet of things so the amount of rights amount of points can be huge so it could be thousand ten thousand hundred thousand and the ability to process all that kind of data in an efficient way is quite untrivial and you can see here as well my twitter LinkedIn, so you can connect, you can ask any questions you have related to the topic. So just don't be shy. And um, my talk is uh, a little bit funny because uh, here I try to put together my hobby and uh, one of case study which I wanted to uh to explore so i mean collect data from different kind of sensors write those data <coughs> to the cloud and then process and visualize uh all the parameters which reveal a lot of insights if we talk about growing some uh, strains of peppers and uh, any strain that needs a lot of uh, attention so again we live in the city in the northern climate we have a quite long winters and uh, plants flowers give some sort of feel of nature around around me around you and the main problem is that it's quite tricky sometimes to grow some tropical species indoor because you need to have a uh, microclimate conditions uh, within a specific range and you need to change that microclimate within the time so for example some young seedlings need different amount of humidity than for example blooming uh, plant and again i have a olive tree and uh, i have a different kind of peppers and uh, as I said, the uh, tricky moments with that, that every plant species has own requirements over preferable temperature, humidity, light, air condition. And there is differences in different stages of plant life. And uh, seedlings and the vegetarian stage requ requires high relative humidity. And uh, vice versa, bloom phase need less humidity and lower te temperatures so plant things that uh it that autumn is started and we need to hurry up so you can see some sort of results <coughs> as i said this is specific uh specific strange uh with a with a index of uh, camels more than uh 300 000 for some sort of habanero or uh, more than a million for uh, for Jack Reaper, for Apocalypse Chocolate. So again, there is a lot of uh, different kind of strange strains which I try to to grow. So you can see the uh, starting of different kind of seedlings, and after after seedlings got some energy, 
So I started to put them in a in a different kind of 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 growery. So how the pipeline was built? Uh, so for me, it was quite important to test the main pipeline. So I collect the data from my sensors. Uh, maybe I need some sort of processing that data, and then I send that data to the storage. So uh, I didn't uh, invest in a very high quality sensors with industrial quality, because again, for me, it was quite important to uh, test main pipeline. And another reason was that uh, amount of error from those non-production sensors wa was quite tolerable. And uh, uh, I had the sensors which measured temperature, and it was analog sensors. I had the digital temperature and humidity sensors. I had the ambient light, quality of air, which uh, measures amount of particles in the air, and some, some other well. So that was sent to Arduino controller, and then written to InfluxDB, which was deployed in digital ocean. So uh, you can see that how it was start with uh, some uh, test on uh, how, how, how to build configuration, which again is quite easy. You can find any information how to wire up any sensor which you buy to Arduino. So you can see, for example, here is an example which is related with a uh, temperature and humidity sensor, how to, how to plug in it into Arduino. In the same way, there is a, a lot of examples in Arduino how to collect data from outer sensors and how to send it further for, for collecting. There is a one uh, possibility how, how to build it is to use uh, Arduino with Wi-Fi module. Then you can send your data to InfluxDB in, into the cloud immediately. But uh, for me, I wanted to also to control the amount of data, and maybe I didn't know I didn't uh, know at that time that maybe I need some sort of conversion of data. So you can see there is uh, some sort of sensors here and in in the uh, uh, backyard. So how it looked like? Uh, you can see that data was sent over USB, and you can see that uh, amount of data. Uh, taken from the sensors was written into the uh, main machine. And uh, uh, we had more than a one and a half millions of different measurements. I mean that uh, all the sensors gave within a two months about a, a quite large amount of information. We collect all the data once a minute. And you can see here uh, this is Grafana, uh, quite easy to set up, quite uh, quite good uh, for visualization of your data. And here is setup which I made for uh, collecting all the sensor data and showing me in my in one uh, dashboard. So you can see that uh, there is some data related with a uh, with a. Uh, uh, light, but there is some uh, interesting things. So here I have, for example, humidity problem. <coughs> Why? Because again, I live in a northern country, and uh, when autumn start uh, and uh, temperature of air fell down, then the humidity as well uh, fell down. And uh, without the sensors, without uh, possibility of understanding what's going on that I see here, I have a too, a too small amount of uh, humidity. I need to, to edit it. And without this kind of information, I didn't have any visibility or any understanding what, what's going on. And here is one of my uh, so-called exploration. This is uh, uh, data which is collected from the sensor, which measures amount of particles in the air. And you can see that starting from November, amount of those particles in the air increased significantly. So 
uh, around two and a half, three times than normal one. And uh, it was quite unusual. And after a while, uh, it was found that probably it is related to the starting of heat and season, because again, temperature and air uh, is quite cold in the northern country. So we started to uh, to our heat and season. Our station started to produce energy and hot water, and that's why we had increases, increasing particles which came from uh, burning. But this this was just one side of a coin, because after uh, after two weeks, uh, this is a page from our one of the main media in Estonia, where I can translate your to your header that secret of uh, of dirty streets of Tallinn. So. Uh, the main question was why we have so dirty streets and question was also quite interesting uh, uh, answer so you can see that one of the main uh, production lines which product raw material for construction uh, located here and my sensors were located also quite near that pollution source so that's also this was one of the main source of main source of pollution in that sense and you can see how uh, how automated thi how automated things give a possibility to have collect huge amount of data uh, how to have a visibility or insight to all data which we need so for example again i found that we have a problem with humidity we had a problem with uh, with the quality of air we had some problems in the temperature so again without that it's quite hard to understand what's going on and this was a quite good use case where you can collect your data from uh, different kind of sensors internet of things and i, I can say that uh you can afford a very large amount of sensor data even on a small machine so for us we collect this type of data uh it was quite small lot and uh, we made some assessment on a medium-sized machine it's possible to hold uh data from a hundred and hundreds of thousands of sensors with a different amount of 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 uh, tagging and uh, uh another point that this uh this uh, growing and data that was collected it was a part of testing our engine which we want to open source soon an engine can process uh, all these sensor data more than one and a half million points and compare with different kind of models so for example we can set up some agri agricultural models for example if you want to grow uh, peppers or you want to grow wine wine in wine yards then here we have a different optimal condition for different time and we make a back test with our engine and get speed more than seven and uh, uh, seven thousand and five hundred events processed per second on a very small machine so processing of one and a half million of points was has taken less than a minute and this year we plan to start uh more in a more advanced level because again we had a uh, quite effective way how to collect data how to process that and we want to put more uh better better sensors production quality to a wine yard so collect data about growing a wine yard and how to preserve how to hold necessary conditions for larger part of agricultural uh agricultural area so again this will be like a quite good case study which can also bring a visibility to 
uh, agricultural uh, area. So uh, if you have any questions related to that, then feel free to, to, to ask using QA. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. And I noticed that Anais has been answering many of your questions uh, using the chat feature in the Q&A box. So thank you, Anais, for circling back to everyone's mm -hmm. online questions. Sure thing. Absolutely. If you have any questions for Alex, uh, let's go ahead and it looks like Eduardo may have a question. Uh, I'm not sure the context here, but it says digital ocean cloud. Yeah, it was uh, just uh, so. Okay, it was uh, chosen quite uh, fast because again we it was autumn. We need some uh, storage. Let's check some. Uh, uh, let's check some requirements, some costs. Okay, digital ocean looks fine. And actually, yeah, we start. We I didn't remember, but we have a quite small a machine here, quite cheap, and uh, it it uh, it work with the uh, InfluxDB, with Grafana, with everything we need, and yeah, quite fine. Great, thank you so much. Um, if you would like to go ahead and stop sharing your slides now, I'll yeah. go ahead and. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. And the main idea, yes, that if we collect data from our sensors, no matter where from, so-called uh, data agnostic solution. So it doesn't matter where from your data uh, is coming. So uh, when you have that data in your InfluxDB, then you can process and work this data according to your, for example, requirements. And that's why it's quite easy to set up, uh, for example, for those agricultural, uh, can set up a condition necessary for different stage. Again, if you have a different kind of conditions from humidity, temperature, soil, uh, pH, and so on and so on, then it's quite hard and tricky to, to understand or to collect those data regularly. Absolutely. Once you create pipeline, it can be done in an automatic way. You just forget about that and every, you can check your data, you can check your current condition, you can check if something is going on anytime from your phone, from your, any machine you have near you, which is amazing. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that presentation, Alex. Yeah, one question more. Do you have a built list of parts in Vault and Setup? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, actually, I want, I, pub I publish, will publish soon an article about, uh, about uh, this experience, case study, with a more details. So, yeah. But I can, I can tell you that, uh, uh, set up from hardware part is quite cheap. So it's uh, uh, quite cheap uh, Arduino controller. And uh, the, the, most co the, the most expensive part is uh, a sensors, if you want, especially production quality. So you can, you can buy cheap sensors within a $5, within 10, 15. But if you want to have a production quality sensors, you need to pay $50 and so on and so on. So but again, it doesn't matter how your pipeline is working. So sensors with the production quality and sensors with not so production quality anyway, give you data and how you work with that is up to you. But uh, what I wanted also to point to, you should check your sensor uh, error boundaries because maybe sometimes it's quite often that this error it's quite okay for us. So if you do, do not have very, very specific, uh, I don't know, uh, industry where you need some very, very clean air or you need extremely, extremely clear, uh, clean surfaces, then uh, usual sensors can help a lot. And it's easy, easy to, to remove. So I want, I, I published this article I guess within this next week, and share uh, and share this in, with the community, with within my Twitter, and and so on. Awesome! Yeah, let us know. Oh, so that data. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll post that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and we'll touch on a couple of uh, quick announcements, and then we'll get right to the raffle.
Uh, that way we can be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I want to say that I hope everyone tuning in today, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for joining us. And I hope that you're able to stay involved and be a part of the community during these kind of confusing, uncertain times. I know that many of us have been tucked away in our homes right now. And if you're like me, uh, maybe even feeling a little bit isolated. Uh, we're living in a time right now where it's entirely possible that an entire week can go by where you don't interact with anyone outside of your personal circle, maybe other than the clerk at the market. Um, so it's super important to maintain um, a sense of connection and a sense of community. Um, so for that reason, I want to encourage everyone to hop over to the InfluxDB community forum, uh, which can be found at community.influxdata.com. It's a great place to poke around, ask questions, find help, learn solutions, share ideas, and follow discussions. Uh, Ana Yis is over there all the time, so if you had any questions that weren't able to be addressed during the call today, uh, you can certainly provide those there, and Ana Yis will uh, likely be able to circle by and provide some input for you. Um, we also have a Slack workspace that is open to our community. It can be accessed via influxdata.com forward slash Slack. Uh, this is a great place to meet other community members, share your knowledge, and get help uh, from people from the community and staff. And even if you don't have a support issue or a technical question, uh, we encourage you to come stop by the Slack, join, join the community channel, introduce yourself and socialize with other members of the community, something that's super important right now. And uh, if you're a Redditor, uh, we do have an InfluxDB subreddit available for you uh, in case you wanna pop over and check that out. Uh, it is currently kind of a growing community. It's off to a good start and I do look forward to kind of seeing it grow more over time. Um, and last but not least, uh, if you'd like to share with us, if you're like me and social distancing uh, that's going on means that you're finding a lot more free time on your hands to work on hobbies and side projects that interest you. Uh, so if you've been related to something, uh, if you've been working on something related to time series data that you'd like to share with the time series community, uh, please do let us know. We're always looking for people who'd like to speak and share about what they're working on. Uh, you can let us know if you're interested by using the Q&A feature now or by reaching out via email. Um, I, my email is mellis at influxdata.com, and I'm always happy to hear from people in the community. Uh, open positions. One of the things that we'd love to do uh, at the time series meetups is to share open positions and job opportunities at our respective companies. Uh, I think it's something that's important now more than ever, as some of us might be between positions and looking for organizations that are still actively seeking employees. Uh, we went from an amazingly strong job market to a much weaker job market very quickly, and it's affected many people, maybe some people on this call today. Um, so if your company is hiring, please use the chat feature in the Zoom room to share with the group. Let us know the name of the company, the types of roles that you're looking to fill, and whether or not the position is remote friendly. Um, it's super important that we support one another, particularly during uh, kind of the times that we find ourselves in right now. Um, I know here at Influx Data, we're currently looking to fill software engineering e-commerce roles based out of New York and San Francisco. We're also looking for a full stack developer to work with our San Francisco team. Um, however, if you're not located in one of these cities, we are a remote friendly company and we welcome all qualified applicants uh, to submit their applications and apply. So I'd like to see if you know of any uh, companies or positions that your company is looking to fill, go ahead and add that to this uh, chat and we'll go ahead and hop over to the raffle section. Okay, now it's time for our raffle. Uh, this is gonna be kind of interesting to do live. So the way we can do this is we can use the uh, chat and the Q and A section. Uh, what we're gonna do is call out some winners and just let us know if you're live on the call. And if you are, then we'll follow it via email to get your shipping information. That way we can send some swag out to you. We have lots of good things to give away today. I'll back up a little bit and see if you can see this. We have uh, hoodies, which uh, influx data, the one like I'm wearing right now. Hopefully you can see that. We also have some really cool socks, influx data socks that we'll be giving out. And influx data t-shirts uh, that I do not have with me right now to show you. Uh, so the way we did the raffle is we took everyone who registered uh, and then we put them into an ordered list uh, and then we used a random number generator uh, to designate uh, which person in the list would be receiving various prizes. 
So hopefully everyone's in the, uh, on the call now, and if not, we'll just go move down to some alternates and uh, keep going until we find our winners. Uh, so first person, uh, we'll start off with Socks. Uh, Toussaint Booz, are you on the call? Please let us know using the Q&A or the chat feature. Uh, also, we have Jaising Zhu. Are you on the call? Please let us know. And we also have Khan Benbir. If you are live on the chat, please do let us know. We'll give those people just a moment to reply. Uh, now we'll move over to our shirt winners. Uh, Luca Nikolai, are you live on the call? Uh, also, Alex Rosenthal, are you live on the call? And for our hoodie, we have Sarah Johnson. Please let us know if you're live on the call. We'll take a moment just to take a look and see who's been able to reply. Uh, Kelsey Comstock asked, any idea what our next planned meetup is? I have some colleagues that would like to join the next session. Yes, our next meetup is going to be on April 30th, and uh, I'll be sharing some more information about that here in just a second. All right, just a moment. Uh, Courtney, I am struggling to see the chat window right now. I do see the Q&A window, but not the chat window. Um, so if you could assist me with calling out some additional winners. Uh, sure. Uh, is Vince Chani still on? You don't mind just putting it in the chat if you're still online? All right, I'll call out a few others. Uh, Steve Crowell. Okay, so Michael, um, Steve is here, Vince is here, and Sia Ha is still here. Great. <laughs> So how many uh, more draws do we have? Uh, let's go ahead and do three more. Okay, uh, Michael, uh, Mik sorry, Mikkel Oba. <coughs> Carl J and Juliet E. All right, um, Juliet is here. Juliet E. Great. All right, um, so I'm just trying to make sure. Uh, Mikhail Oba is here. Just going through the chat right now, confirming everyone.
Perfect. I think we have enough winners to send out swag to everybody. So what we will do is we will uh, reach out to people via email. And uh, if we have anything extra that we can send out, we'll reach out uh, and let, hey, Rosa. Yes, yeah, so we've got you written down, Rosa. Thank you so much for letting us know. Uh, so we'll reach out to the winners via email and we'll just gather a little bit of information so that we can send out the swag gear to you. Uh, please do keep in mind that our distribution hub is operating a little bit slower than it normally would. Uh, so what that means is that uh, it's just going to take a little bit longer to get the gear out to you. They're working with a limited staff, uh, so please be patient with us and with them as they do the best they can with uh, limited resources at the time. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, the next meetup, the next virtual meetup is going to be taking place April 30th. You can hop over to influxdata.com forward slash community dash showcase. Uh, to find out more information about timing and to register for the event. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, thank you so much for the comments. The meetup was amazing. We really appreciate that. Uh, we hope to be able to provide some more great content for you next month, and we hope to see you all there. Uh, thank you all for joining, and with that, we'll go ahead and sign off.